Hey Prestige Heads, Danny here. We teased at the end of 2023 that we had big news coming in 2024, and here it is. American Prestige has decided to partner with The Nation magazine, which will syndicate our free episodes on their podcast feed. We think and hope this is an opportunity to bring our message about the incredible problems with U.S. foreign policy to a wider audience. So, to already existing Prestige Heads, we want to thank you so much for all of your support, and we'd like to welcome the people who might just be tuning in for the first time. If you like what you hear, you should check out our Substack at AmericanPrestige.com, where we've got hundreds of episodes on a diversity of topics. In particular, I'd like to highlight our series with Rashid Khalidi on the history of Palestine, our series with Sean Fear on the history of Vietnam, and our interviews with people like Noam Chomsky and Pulitzer Prize winner Ader Ferrer on the history of the left and Cuba, respectively. If you subscribe to the podcast, you'll get access to hundreds of bonus episodes. Suffice to say, there's a lot of content we've got to offer. Happily for everyone, our partnership with The Nation comes with some perks. Above all, people who decide to subscribe to American Prestige at the founders level will receive a year-long digital subscription to The Nation. To subscribe, go to www.americanprestigepod.com slash subscribe and select the category of founding member. Once you subscribe, we'll reach out to you to see if you're interested in the Nation digital subscription to get your name and email, which we'll give to the Nation to get the process going. And of course, those of you who are already AP subscribers and who want to upgrade to the founder level to get the Nation subscription should see a button to upgrade on our homepage. And if you're already a founder, Jake will reach out to you to see if you're interested in the subscription. And if you are, you can give him your information. Okay, that's it for now. We'd like to reiterate our thanks to all of you. We really, truly can't do any of this without your support. That's kind of conversation to your soul. That's conversation to your soul. Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with my friend and comrade, Derek Davison. And we're very excited to welcome to the podcast today, Carolyn Eisenberg. Carolyn is a professor of history at Hofstra University and the author of several books, including most recently Fire and Rain, Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia. So Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to do this. So why don't we start, we're, we're writing in the wake of Kissinger's recent death, and you are someone who spent a lot of your time thinking about Kissinger. So maybe taking the 40,000 foot view, what role do you think Kissinger actually played in U.S. foreign policy? And then sort of an addendum to that is why do you think he's reached such an outsized place in the American imagination among the left, center, and right? Well, I think, you know, that for the period in which uh, Kissinger was working for Nixon and then for Gerald Ford, he had a tremendous role in almost every important aspect of U.S. foreign policy. Um, As you know, in in Nixon's first term, he was a national security advisor, not the secretary of state. And I think it's fair to say that during that four-year period, his relationship to the State Department and to its secretary was absolutely abysmal. And I think, truthfully, it was a condition of him staying on into a second term that he would become Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. William Rogers, the Secretary of State at the time, uh, was basically told by Nixon that he could not last until the second term. There was a deal struck in which Rogers was allowed to stay on for a couple of months while the Vietnam War ended. But once he was gone, uh, Kissinger had both positions, and he's the only person um, to have done that. And I think it's a fair generalization to say that in almost every area of American foreign policy during that whole time period, uh, Kissinger was a major player. If I could also add just one other thing, I don't know if people have mentioned this, but I think it's important which is that that Watergate helped him. 
absent Watergate, things might have gone in a different way, um, in particular because Nixon most of the time couldn't stand him and was always hoping to get rid of him. But as Watergate was unfolding and getting more and more serious by the month, um, Kissinger uh, becomes crucial because he's the one top presidential person that has not been caught in the Watergate net. And so he has a kind of stand, public standing um, that none of these other people did. And Nixon becomes much more dependent on him because of Watergate. So then before we dive into like what he actually did, so he becomes important due to Watergate, but like we're not talking about most secretaries of state or national security advisors 50 years later. Ver people rarely mention someone like Walt Whitman Rostow or John Foster Dulles, people who are also incredibly influential, particularly Dulles on U.S. foreign relations. What is it about Kissinger? Is it the German accent? Is it his bon mot? Is it the Jewishness? Is it the fact that he founded Kissinger Associates? What do you think it was about this particular guy that basically he'll be like, ironically enough, one of the quote unquote great figures of American history? I think people will be talking about Kissinger in a couple hundred years, at least Kissinger and Nixon. Not sure that's that'll necessarily be the case. That's with very Paris. bold of you to assume that people will be around in a couple hundred <laughs> that's years. That's true. Well, any of us will be here. My, my children, you know, that, uh, at that as they time. survive the climate wars. But I think you know what I'm saying, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, you know, I think one thing that we can't minimize is, um, I mean, television wasn't as big in the day of John Foster Dulles. However, I think it's also relevant to think about John Foster Dulles, and most people don't, which is your point, is that he, even if he had had all the media access that Kissinger did, he would never have wanted to be out front. I mean, his preference, he had very specific policy goals. He had the year of the president. He had the brother at head of CIA. Dulles wanted to work behind the scenes. So he was a, probably the most powerful secretary of state, certainly prior to, to Kissinger. But the key thing about Kissinger is that he was a publicity hound. And he wanted to be out in, in front of the cameras. Uh, he wanted to be interviewed. He wanted to be seen at public events. He was kind of an omnipresent guy. And at times, Nixon was kind of sick of it and really you know, kept dreaming of firing him. I mean, there's numbers of times where Nixon is pondering how happy he'll be to be rid of him, you know, in the second term. But again, with Watergate, it actually served Nixon's purpose to have Kissinger out in front of the cameras um, as much as possible, you know, especially where Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Colson and all these characters, you know, had been sort of discredited. So even though this was in fact one of the Kissinger traits Nixon couldn't stand, in the end, he was wily enough to under to recognize that that Kissinger was an asset. So I, I, you know, I think yes, Kissinger did a lot of important things. Yes, he probably had a wider reach on policy than most people. Uh, but I, don't, I would not minimize the fact that he was always out there talking to the public. So let's get into the wars in Southeast Asia. Why focus on these wars? Or, or, or maybe just to, to ask a provocative question just to get us going. There's been a lot <laughs> written about these wars. What right. what new is there to uncover? And why focus from this particular Nixon-Kissinger lens? What does it reveal that the, you know, the reams of writing on these wars don't? Well, I would say two things, but, but preface it when... I worked on my book for almost 20 years and normal people, some in my family would say, why? There's so much about these people that's already out. What could you possibly learn or, or want to communicate to them? So I just want to acknowledge that that question that you're asking, it's been asked many a time. Um, there's a couple of things. One is actually a little bit at odds with the question, which is that one of my goals was actually to contextualize Kissinger and Nixon, for that matter. And I struggled with that because I couldn't get a good book title that would somehow indicate that. They were the center. They were the final deciders, right? And they were the public figures. But I was very interested in the question of why it was that these two people, you know, that, I mean, they weren't dummies, but they also weren't geniuses. Why is it, you know, that they were able 
to make those final decisions? What was behind those decisions? So that's actually really important. And I keep thinking that my book title is actually undermines that point, which is that most of the things that Nixon and Kissinger did with regard to the Vietnam War, these were policies that many other people would have followed. These were policies in particular that the military wanted. So you want to remember also that you know, the military got sick of McNamara, right? But the military had lots of ideas about all the things they could be doing in Vietnam. And so anyway, one of my goals was to really look at these two people in context and to understand why they were able to make the decisions that they did. How, how did that actually happen? You know, given the fact that their policies, you know, led to the death of between twenty and 30,000 more Americans. It maybe led to the death of two to three million Asians. And it was a failure. <laughs> and Nixon was reelected. So that's one of my interests, actually. It was really that. And, and, um, and I have a lot about that in the book, although I can't help feeling that I have so many quotes from Nixon and Kissinger that are despicable. <laughs> many readers just can't stop looking at those quotes. But in any case, that was one of the things... And then there's really a second thing, which I think is what, you know, really drove my book, which is that so many of the books that were written on this subject, you know, looked at high policy. What did this person say to that person? And what they didn't do was they didn't look at the impact of the policy on anybody, or it would be very cursory. Oh, you know, okay, this battle happened. So many people died. Which, what I just did, but that's not my book, which is 500 pages. But that, but that the narrative was almost always, in almost every book, disconnected from the human impact of it. And so that was a major goal. And I think it reflected my teaching and my feeling that students get bored if they don't know why something, I mean, I see you shaking your head because you teach, you know, that when, when the high policy is disconnected from anything, it's boring. And it's insignificant. So that was really a major thing. And I didn't think books, with the possible exception of Shawcross, did that very much. Um, you know, then there were a lot of memoirs and subjective experiences and so forth. But I really wanted to connect what they were doing, those decisions, with what was happening to our soldiers, to our students, to Laotians, to Cambodians, to Vietnamese. I mean, obviously, this is, you know, spot check. It couldn't be as comprehensive, but that was really important. And if I, if I could just keep going on for one more second, this is what happens when you have somebody who's written 500 pages, is one of the things that I came to appreciate, you know, which I didn't exactly get in the beginning, is that the disconnection of Nixon and Kissinger from what was happening on the ground, not to mention the disconnection of most of the people around them, but, you know, them in particular, they had so little empathy or imagination or curiosity about things, right? And when they read, picked up the New York Times and they read, you know, somebody, um, you know, writing some description of what was happening, they hated those people. So they cut that knowledge out. It was not present in their deliberations. What is the effect of what we're doing? And in the end, the great irony was their lack of interest in that, and they're not alone by any means, made them stupid actually made terrible decisions, um, decisions that did not serve them well because they weren't paying attention. Carolyn, I wonder if we could pick up on uh, the first part of your, your answer there where you talked about how this uh, the, the decision to expand the war in Southeast Asia was something that was pushed by the military. I'm curious, what was the dynamic going on there? Why were Kissinger and Nixon, how did they decide who to listen to, and who were they ignoring? What was sort of the internal uh, discussion that, that happened within the administration? Well, they, you know, the, the loudest voices in the room were really coming from the military. I mean, there were, the, the cabinet wasn't significant, um, but, you know, the national security structures were. And, you know, there was constant deliberations with a variety of high-level people, and Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff, which, you know, changed. They were also paying very close attention to MACFI in, in Vietnam, the, the U.S. headquarters there headed by Creighton Abrams. 
had a very loud voice in these deliberations. And one of the little quirky things that happened, and I didn't fully appreciate it. This is a little bit more, maybe a year in to the situation. One of the loudest voices was Al Haig, who you might say at the beginning was kind of a, a, a nobody, but Kissinger increasingly re- and it's a rely on him and it gets, just becomes huge actually, um, as their connection to the military. So Haig is going over there repeatedly, you know, conferring with Creighton Abrams and coming back and bringing, you know, the word of truth. Um, so that's actually one of the reasons. And I mean, it's very pertinent to Cambodia. Um, and, you know, one of the things that people bring up and, you know, my, my various friends who write about this, you know, tend to talk a lot about Kissinger in Cambodia and his role there. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, his role was terrible as a, on most issues, but the, the impetus for Cambodia was the military. And it wasn't to demonstrate that Nixon was crazy. If what it was related to was that North Vietnamese troops were over the border in Cambodia. You know, now if you were in the peace movement back then, which I was, and that we pay no attention to that. You know, they say, "Oh, by the way, there's all these thousands of Vietnamese troops on the other side of the border." You know, we're all like rolling our eyes. Yeah, that's just another lie. It wasn't. And one thing to remember is that after 10, and I have never managed to find the exact numbers, so don't ask. But what is true is that after 10, there's a lot of North Vietnamese troops that are not in South Vietnam at that point. They're, they are, they've got, gone over the border, more of them into Cambodia, into Laos, back over the DMZ and into North Vietnam itself. So the U.S. military, which had been wanting to bomb Cambodia for years, actually has a louder voice, partly because that is where a lot of troops were. So, I mean, that's a very significant thing. I don't know if I should stop for breath or just keep going on this point about instead of we stay with Cambodia a little bit. No, stay with Cambodia. That's cool. Our, our listeners like like learning stuff. They can handle it. Right, guys? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, well, I know, obviously, Greg Rand that, you know, spoke to you about that. But, you know, one of the things also, I mean, again, I was very, very interested in this question, the context and the question of what are the relevant pressures that actually did affect decision making? Um, Now, on Cambodia, there were people in the State Department, for example, who thought it was a bad idea. But you have to link Cambodia to something else that was happening, which, again, as a peace activist, I didn't know anyone who paid attention to it. Okay, But... The, the, the peace movement was also having an impact on U.S. policy. It wasn't like nothing. It was significant from the very beginning, but only in certain ways, you know, which is probably the most important way it was significant was that, remember, if Nixon ran as a person with a secret plan for peace, he didn't have one. However, it was understood, and here I make a big fuss about Melvin Laird, so I could talk about him for quite a long time. But Melvin Laird is the link, not to the military, he's the link to politics. He's come out of the Congress, he talks to these people all the time. He's come from Wisconsin. He's very attuned to the political currents, which Nixon cares about. So one of the things that Laird does very early, and one way that he persuades Nixon, is he advocates that U.S. troops have to start coming out of Vietnam. Right. And he's he's pushing that, you know, probably in the second month of the administration, we have to start bringing troops out. That's a, that is non-negotiable. You have to show the American people that you're doing something. And on that point, Nixon was ultimately persuaded. He wasn't in a rush, but he recognized that the, the correctness of Laird's pressure. And so to some extent, when you think about Cambodia, there's another sort of subtle factor here which is that the military is really mad about this troop removal policy. From the beginning, they're furious about that. So there's a little bit of a sense of a trade, which is also coming in. And I'm not saying that it's a final cause, but it's definitely in the atmosphere, which is that if you're going to start moving troops out and you're going to be starting to make the military mad, let's do something that they want us to do, and which even makes sense to us. I mean, it makes sense to Nixon and Kissinger. The North Vietnamese troops are over the border. Let's let's blow them up. So I think that that's, you know, if you're asking a question, why did, was the military listened to? 
um, and how, there's a kind of mixed intermixture of, of factors. But the military influence over U.S. policy is very significant. And remember, Kissinger is a conformist. I mean, that's the great irony of all this. You know, he and Nixon are no dummies. That's true. They're smart. Right. But they're basically conformists. Nix, you know, Kissinger doesn't get to be a big shot because he's a, de- a deviant, original, out of the box guy. Right. He gets because he's been, you know, sucking up to all kinds of people and he mostly says things that everyone agrees with. Did on Nixon. So, you know, in terms of the fact that they come in, the war is still going on. You have 550,000 American troops in Vietnam. You feel some pressure to accomplish something. Who are you going to listen to? So the military has a, has a, has a very powerful voice at the beginning. Later, it changes, and they get really mad at the military. But that's not true for the first two years. Well, I, I, let's, I, I wanted to actually take a step back and ask a methodological question, because, you know, in some sense, the last 15, at this point, 20 years of scholarship in the history of foreign relations has been to center the United States and been to emphasize, you know, other actors or transnational flows, um, international actors, quote unquote. But as someone who looked at this, what do you think was actually driving decision making in Vietnam? You know, IR scholars view the world as a risk board. It's a bit of a a parody, but there's some element of truth there. But what made Kissinger and Nixon do what they did? Was it primarily domestic factors? Is it politics? it's, I mean, one thing that has to be put in, I, I actually think there's two different questions in one, so I'm tempted to answer the easier one, actually, as, it, as any <laughs> sensible guess would do. Uh, one is about the motivation of, um, you know, of the enemy. And it's probably the thing I've been most criticized for by anybody, which is I was very cautious about attributing motives. And I... I Thought later, attributing mo- I attribute lots of motives to the Americans, but I don't do anything comparable for the Vietnamese. And I think I actually got oddly even more cautious about that because since I had amazing sources on the U.S. side, especially the tapes and the Kissinger telecons, I think I got hesitant about saying anything without access to comparable documentation. That said, I mean, we're talking about two Vietnams and the first, the we talk about South Vietnam, I don't think there's much mystery. They, their goal was to win and to defeat the North and to remain as a separate government. And from that perspective, to keep the American forces inside their what they called their country for as long as possible. I mean, that, you know, just there's literally nothing to indicate to the contrary. They wanted to keep the war going. But when just to jump ahead for a bit, well, you know, when, when they finally in not, end of 72, not 73, the U.S. is going to sign a peace agreement of uh, the South and leave South Vietnam is, you know, is very furious. So then the question is North Vietnam. And, you know, what do we know about that? And, you know, my simple minded answer is that they wanted to keep fighting. I don't think they were terribly interested in a peace agreement. Or in any event, the peace agreement that Nixon and Kissinger were offering for much of the time of change, which included mutual troop withdrawal, right? This was the U.S. position that they, we take our troops out and the North Sea and Mom would take their troops out of the South, which is that is the U.S. position for at least a year. So from the North Sea, this is a complete non-starter, you know, including the point that from their perspective, they're not two countries. And they're not on an equal basis with the U.S. The U.S. are foreign troops. They're Vietnamese. And in fact, you know, many of the people that are, you know, in the North Vietnamese military are coming, you know, they originated, they were from the South. And they had gone north at various points. Um, so the whole distinction the Americans were utilizing never, never resonated. So then the way that I read that is that the North wanted to fight, obviously, the South wanted to fight, obviously, but the course of the war was largely determined by the United States. Is well, that wrong? Well, yes and no. I mean, you could turn it the other way in the sense that, first of all, if North Vietnam had forces had not been as effective as they were, right? I mean, that's the constant surprise, you know, from Jack Kennedy to Linda Johnson to Nixon, right, is that the other side keeps fighting, and they can take tremendous losses um, and make enormous sacrifices on the other side. 
but nothing seemed to stop. No, of, I mean, of course, like in history, right. yes, of course. But I'm talking if you're if you're constructing a causal hierarchy for why the war proceeded as it did, where would you place what? I'm curious. Well, for why, I mean, so uh, allowing for the incredible persistence of the adversary, you know, the issue is why didn't Nixon just end the war? And actually, in my class, a hundred years ago, I had my students revolted and they said they had read Marilyn Young's book and they listened to me and they said, you know, you people are not explaining Nixon at all. This makes no sense to us. Here's Richard Nixon. He is a brilliant politician, if nothing else. This war has been a disaster. It has discredited his predecessor, who was on track to win. Why would Richard Nixon go on, right? I mean, why didn't he just say, this is a mistake, I'm ending it, goodbye. And, you know, there's not, I mean, one, one part of that answer is the character of Nixon himself, who was at that time a convinced cold warrior. He changes a lot over, over time. So this is his mentality. Kissinger is not there to preside over a loss. Now, Kissinger has the illusion at the beginning that he is such a brilliant negotiator that once he sits down with the North Vietnamese, that he's going to be able to make a deal. You know, why he thought that is a bit of a mystery, but that was his attitude. So I can do it, but I do need the troops to stay. He didn't want any U.S. troops withdrawn. And he argued constantly, you know, against that. But maybe the most important point here is that in terms of the entire bureaucracy, the whole, those structures that had already grown so big, you know, in CIA and the Joint Chiefs and the Army and the Air Force, all of this, nobody was prepared in those agencies. Nobody was advocating for the U.S. to withdraw and let the other side win. Nobody. And I, one thing that you may, you know, both know, you know, if you've read Daniel Ellsberg's autobiography, Secrets, at the beginning, Ellsberg is a consultant to Kissinger. You know, they've known each other from Harvard, and Kissinger thought he was smart. And one of the things that Ellsberg does for Kissinger right at the beginning is help to prepare these questionnaires that would go out to all the different bureaucracies with a zillion questions about every little aspect of the war. And partly that, you know, Kissinger liked the idea because then he could spy on everybody, he'd know what everybody's thinking. So this huge questionnaire, you know, is out and takes quite a while for everybody to answer all the questions. But the point is nobody is advocating withdrawal of the U.S., nobody. So, you know, in terms of, I mean, what are the chances that Richard Nixon, Cold Warrior, is going to come in, ignore everybody, and say this war is a loser, and I'm I'm gonna I'm just gonna get us out and let North Vietnam fall at the beginning. You know, we've seen a little lesson from Joe Biden in Af- Afghanistan, right? I mean, this was totally not Joe Biden's fault, any of it, right? But the very simple fact that it was a collapse and that it was a mess at the airport and you know so forth. You know, he he paid a huge price for that. Well, Richard Nixon wasn't gonna do anything like that. Yes. So you divide your book with Lamson 719. Could you talk about why you made that decision, what this is, and why you think it's been um, overlooked in the literature? Yeah, I'm not sure why it's been overlooked in the literature, but what I would say about Lamson 719 is that when I started doing my research, I did I had no opinion about this whatsoever. And it was really because I was just reading a lot of declassified material, you know, position papers. And of course, just that, I mean, not not irrelevantly, um, this is when Nixon starts taping. He's taping, um, he's starting in early 1971, and that's when Lamson 719 becomes available. And you also have Kissinger was transcribing his phone conversation, so you'll have all of that. So there's a lot of material. And it's only when I started really reading it and also looking back at the press, particularly the New York Times, that I start to realize this was big, like this was really important and a kind of turning point. It was nothing that was in my head about this. So to answer your question, by the time that you're in 1971, right, U.S. has been withdrawing troops now 
for two years. Um, so you have diminished um, American military power. And to a significant extent, Nixon had been persuaded by Laird to try to minimize the use of American troops in combat. And also they were on a trajectory to getting all the troops out. And that really needs to be understood. Nixon from the get-go had decided that he was not going to face re-election with all those troops sitting in Vietnam. They were going to go. So here we are, and it's 1971. And one of the things that Nixon's very concerned about is, is there going to be an offensive in, in you know, later that year or even worse in 1972? Is, there, is that going to happen? If, so you really, I mean, there's almost no way to overestimate that. I mean, the fate of Lyndon Johnson hangs heavy upon Nixon all the time, right? And Johnson, it looked like he was going to just, you know, swoop in and win. And then there was the Tet Offensive and he was gone. So that's what, how to not have an offensive as U.S. troops go out. That's what he's concerned with. Now, the United States have been building up Arvin, South Vietnamese Army. Right, been building it up all along. That was Vietnamization, right? The other half of we're going to take our troops out and we're going to have a million man army for South Vietnam and we're going to give them equipment and that's going to work out. So basically, what is decided it, with regard to Laos is that they need an operation in Laos. That, that, that's really important because it's one of the primary ways that the enemy is able to send troops down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and also get equipment down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So the thinking is, if you could just get a lot of troops in there and stop that, you would make it almost impossible for the North Vietnamese to have a big offensive. That's the idea. And what is true is that there is significant American manpower, uh, I'm sorry, um, air, power, air Force presence that is still in Vietnam, and they're still flying and bombing. So the whole idea of Lamps on 719 was here was going to be a great illustration of South Vietnamese military showing how, now that they're bigger and they have all these new weapons, they're going to be super effective. They will still have the advantage of American air power, so they'll have air cover. And the thinking was that they would, you know, the U.S. military would, would escort them right up to the border of Laos. And then they would go on their own, but the U.S. planes would keep bombing, and they would get to the town of Chapong. They would stay there for several months because that was where the crossroads were and significantly reduce the infiltration. So that's what the plan was. And again, there's just, you know, they were so excited about it. Kissinger's thinking this is so brilliant. Now Haig is a big advocate of it and so forth. So the operation starts and there's trouble from the very beginning, which I won't go into, but as they're making their way, you know, across to the border, there's problems that are encountered right away, including bad weather, right? And some people are trying to tell Kissinger, who's not listening, you know, if the weather is bad, U.S. planes can't fly, and then um, what's going to happen is that the, the, that the uh, South Vietnamese military is not going to have air cover. You know, there's warnings. Of, but nevertheless, they go across, they cross into Laos. They take forever to get there. And in fact, they're so slow to move because they're dealing with the counterattack by the enemy that at a certain point, the U.S. sends helicopters in to pick up some of these South Vietnamese troops and bring them to where they're supposed to be. But they get there and there's like high excitement in Washington. Um, oh, look what we've done. They're there. It's going to be really big. It's wonderful. It wasn't. Uh, the North Vietnamese troops had moved. That Some of them that were a little bit more remote, they moved closer. Um, there's very intense military action. The South Vietnamese are not fighting well. And then on top of everything, within a week, um, President Chu announces he's pulling them out. This is completely flabbergasted. <laughs> they are so angry and upset. And, they're, they, and they blame everybody except themselves for this mess. So... Instead of well, so staying, I imagine that's a big shift. I mean, like yeah. the, the relationship with two. So, so what happens after um, Lamson seven nineteen? How does well, this reshape things? Well, I, I just want to say one one last thing about the disaster. Although I managed to write fifty pages about, it, but the disaster is that the South Vietnamese troops are fleeing, right? 
um, last as fast as they can go, and they're terrified. And that's where you have television cameras picking up the fact that you have you have um, South Vietnamese troops clinging to the skids of American helicopters, desperate to get out of there. So the sort of optics of it are absolutely horrible. And so the problem for and and Nixon and Kissinger understand that this has been a terrible disaster, and we have a lot of that on tape um, of of how upset and disturbed they were. And what are they going to do? And they're struggling with this, you know, and, and, you know, they have an ability to lie about a lot of things or to misrepresent things. So they, you know, they do that usual thing. Um, and, and Nixon is going to write another speech to the country, which by the way, he's very skillful at. I mean, back then people thought, oh, you know, Nixon's terrible, whatever, but Nixon's really skillful. He knows how to talk to them. So he's writing a big speech that he thinks is going to cool down the country in some way. But but Nixon for Nixon, first of all, this confirms the fact that all U.S. troops have got to get out of Vietnam before November of 1972. And Kissinger's kind of disappointed, you know, because the one way that the two of them are really different is that Nixon never stops thinking about politics. And that's partly why the peace movement for Nixon is actually really a very big factor in his thinking. And the Johnson story is a very big factor. You know, Kissinger never gets that, right? It's not his thing. So, you know, he's, from his point of view, the whole idea that you're taking troops out, he never agreed with it. He still doesn't agree with it. But you know, basically, you know, Nixon says to him, Henry, this is, we can't ignore this fact of what's happening in the country. I don't know how many times he tells Kissinger, you know, to remember that there's a vote someday, you know, that's happening. So that's, you know, it, it, it deepens Nixon's um, conviction that he has to have the troops in. But then, and I, I just probably the, one of the points of your question, the diplomacy with China and Russia becomes much more important, T- really takes center stage. Um, and there is this moment where the ping pong team, you know, gets invited to come to Beijing. And that's actually followed by an invitation from Mao to send an emissary there to, you know, tr- to try to open up the potential of a visit of some kind. It's not clear right away that he's inviting Nixon. Um, so that happens, and it's like this huge sigh of relief, right, that um, that this has happened. And Kissinger right away sees the political value of this opening. And his point is, and he says it numbers of times, this is going to take Vietnam off the front pages for a while. This is really big. And then, you know, partly, you know, Kissinger likes to, like, engage in a kind of self-deception for, for himself and Nixon. So he begins to say, if we hadn't been as strong as we were, if we hadn't done Laos, which is in fact a failure, they wouldn't respect us. But now they see how powerful we are and we've really done it. We've created something that Democrats had never been able to do, which is the Chinese want to deal with us. So that immediately it turns around this disaster into like some self congratulation. So that that really becomes a huge focus of their attention is China and also the diplomacy with Russia, which has been going on all along. But both of those things move to center stage, certainly for Kissinger, and are very very much tied to the mess that they have in, in Vietnam. What do they want from China and Russia? Well, at first, what they want was they, they, they're different. Um, if, at first, what they want from China is great PR, right? They want Nixon to go to China, right? They, they see that possibility right from the beginning. And they feel like if Nixon can get invited to China, um, then that will really strengthen his image as a peacemaker. So that is really the initial thing. This is going to be phenomenal PR. It's going to be helpful with the public, blah, blah, blah. Um, And so really from that summer of 1971 through the end of 71, 
uh, beginning of 72, a lot of the diplomacy on, on Kissinger's part is really trying to make sure that that visit will happen, that a lot of television cameras are going to be allowed. They have a whole plan for what kind of publicity there's going to be. So when Nixon is toasting people in China, that Americans can wake up in the morning and see this wonderful thing. So there's a whole huge PR thing. Can't uh, really emphasize that enough. But the other thing, which again, I was like totally surprised by this. Yeah, I wasn't looking for it at all. And in fact, I remember somebody said, you know, you're never going to see the transcripts of any of these conversations, but actually they all opened up. And what you see is, first of all, that Kissinger takes a huge shine to Joe and Lai. That is not made up. He loves Joe and Lai. And he's and you have to recognize Kissinger's life is not as pleasant as he wants because he has to spend time talking to nitwits like Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Colson, all these people that he considers to be, you know, way below him. And now he's found a partner and he loves to spend hours and hours with Joanne Lai. He also, however, more pragmatically, um, he begins to think that the Chinese uh, will, could, under certain conditions, put pressure on the North Vietnamese to make concessions at the negotiating table. And now one of the keys to that is, in fact, to let the Chinese government know that the U.S. commitment to Taiwan is not anywhere near as unshakable as the speeches would suggest. So there's a little bit, and, and it gets bigger, really, of trading away Taiwan um, you know, in various ways, which is sort of relevant to now, in a sense. Uh, but letting letting the Chinese get the clear impression that the U.S. is willing to be flexible and ch- to make concessions on Taiwan if they will help with Vietnam. So that's the second thing. You know, a third thing is that they think by getting along with the Chinese, right, that that's going to put pressure on the Russians. And they're very interested in improving relations with the Russians. So I would say all of that is in, and this is the kind of complexity that Kissinger loves. Oh, he's got all these balls in the air and he's thinking of this and he's thinking of that. But it's not as profound as one might, one might imagine. So he thinks China is pressure on the Russians. Now, the Russians, they say, from very early on, could be really helpful in Vietnam. And understand that it's Russian economic and military support that's more important for Han- Hanoi than, you know, um, than the Chinese assistance. So is there a way that the Russians can start pressuring um, Hanoi? And that's something, that is a, an, an idea that um, is present almost from the beginning. And among the really interesting transcripts that are available from those early talks with Dobrynin and meetings is that basically what Kissinger is telling him is, look, we know that what you guys really care about is Eastern Europe. And we used to care about it too. But you know what? We accept the reality here. We accept the reality of, um, you know, of your alliance, the Warsaw Pact. We accept the reality of the divided Germany. We accept the reality of even a divided Berlin. We're not going to bother you about it. And he actually has the audacity to tell at one point, to tell Debrina, you know, and sometimes you might hear us complaining about Eastern Europe. Don't listen to it, because that's just a need that we have certain constituents in the Midwest who really care about it, and so we make speeches about it. It has nothing to do with what we really care about. You can have Eastern Europe. So, but we need your help in Asia. We need your help in in Vietnam. And he's doing so, Carolyn, this. actually, let me let me interrupt for a second, because yes. it, what it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's almost a dialectical relationship happening here, is that you get this, what I would say, broadly positive reaching of agreements with both China and the Soviet Union as almost a dialectical response to the failures in Vietnam. Is is, is that correct? And if so, what does that say about U.S. foreign relations? Nothing, Nothing good, good, but... <laughs> it's very cynical. Um, and there is a dialectical relationship because, well, I mean, one of the things is what I said is happens right from the very beginning, which is we don't care about Eastern Europe. And you can find this in the transcripts. I mean, you know, don't we don't care about that. I mean, that's to me, I honestly like I risk like my eyes are popping. Like you're really telling him that directly. You're gonna say we just do it for voters and here's what so you know there you know it there is. And but what I'm saying also is that the diplomacy with uh 
you know, with the Soviet Union is constantly being affected by what's happening in Southeast Asia. It's, it, they're very intertwined. And um, one of the ways that they're disentangled, um, that they're intertwined, and I have to tell you, Ding, that I have never found a way to say that it's not boring. It's and even in my book, I think people go to sleep, which is about salt, about the arms agreements that, um, you know, they hear so much about, you know, the Kissinger negotiated with the Soviets. Um, because in Kissinger's devious mind, you know, he thinks that the arms agreement is going to be something that is, is it's an incentive for the Russians to be helpful to us. So that's part of where he's coming from. And that's, a, I'm trying to, I've yet to find an interesting way to say this. Uh, you know, numbers of people have made the observation, first of all, Kissinger takes over those negotiations. The U.S. has a delegation in Helsinki. There, you know, these people are earnestly negotiating, but behind the scenes, Kissinger has opened up the secret channel with the Brennan, and he's negotiating the arms agreement, and he's completely undercutting the people in Helsinki. So it, that's a really miserable story um, in and of itself. But a, a number of commentators have made the point that the deal that Kissinger made with the Russians wasn't all that favorable to the United States. And there's always a lot of speculation about how come. I'm just to be a little bit more specific, is that the way that that SALT one got negotiated was a way in which the Russians had the potential to actually be ahead of the United States in uh, ground-launched uh, nuclear missiles and sea-launched nuclear missiles. Um, you know, that they that numerically they were going to have more. Now, at the time, Kissinger said, not so worried because we have MIRV. We have MRF technology, and your listeners may never have heard that term, but it's the ability to put multiple warheads on individual missiles. And at that, back then, the Russians didn't know how to do that. So that was Kissinger's thing. Well, we can't MRF. It doesn't matter if they have bigger numbers and you know, whatever. Well, it, you know, it turned out the Russians acquired MRF. And so a lot of writers is speculating about why did Kissinger give that ground or why did he make that mistake or, you know, whatever. But my own view of this, which is unproven, is that he didn't care that much, that the exact numbers mattered a lot less to him than making a deal with the Russians. And again, that's that's taking place. From, first of all, he gets a lot of credit, which is no small motive for him. Um, but again, it's taking place at a time when he's very interested in a new kind of pressure on the Soviet Union. To, to lean on their North Vietnamese allies. So my own view is that's right. why he was sloppy about it. He wasn't dumb. He was just sloppy. And just to be clear, maybe we could talk for a moment about whether that gambit worked. It, 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 my, my understanding of your argument is that it didn't whatsoever, that China and the Soviet Union, like they were like, you guys should be more flexible. But in the end, they continued to provide them aid and it didn't really work. Could you talk well, a little bit about the effects? Yeah, and I, and I think... Um, I think historians have disagreements about that. Now, one thing that's coming up is that we're, there's going to be a conference in Hanoi at the, um, um, the, the Diplomatic Academy, like in two weeks, which I'm going to, which is bringing together American historians and Vietnamese historians to talk about how the war ended, how the U.S. war ended. So I'm very interested in what the Vietnamese have to say on this exact issue. Um, it's pretty clear that both the Russians and the Chinese did put some pressure on, uh, on North Vietnam. I think there's almost no question that they did. But how significant, I mean, the, the outstanding question is, for all, they didn't cut off aid. Russian aid actually increased, you know, in, in 71, 72. So, you know, what, you know, how meaningful is the pressure? You know, it's a little bit like Joe Biden, who's supposedly pressuring Israel, but is the meanwhile going to give him $14 billion of weapons, you know, and what, so what's that pressure about? And so that's the place where the Russians and the Chinese don't alter. But I think it, they do verbally press the North Vietnamese to make an agreement. 
And, you know, one outstanding question is still, to what extent did that weigh on Hanoi, uh, that they were being urged in that direction? We, one thing we know is that they were furious about it. I mean, the, the leaders in Hanoi, you know, really bitterly resented the fact that the U.S. was going around them in this way and that the Russians and the Chinese were being selfish and their own interests and so forth. So they were very mad. But did that affect, did that pressure make any significant difference? It's hard to really know that with, with any certainty. So maybe as we're coming to the end here, um, how does your book end? What do you think we can learn from the story having told it? And what does this reveal about U.S. foreign relations? Well, you know, if I could just go to one particular point, which we haven't talked about, and which is actually pretty important in my book and relevant to now, is the peace movement. Because part of the story is about how the U.S. peace movement affected policy. I mean, the reality, I mean, first of all, just to go back, because I'm an old lady, so I remember how we always thought, we're having no effect. I'm on my 93rd demonstration, and <laughs> makes no one cares. You know, yes, yeah, 7 million Americans are demonstrating. It doesn't matter. So that's how we felt uh, at the time. I don't think that now. Um, and I would say the most important effect of the peace movement is the removal of U.S. troops from Vietnam. We never paid much attention to it. We always said it was a trick or they're bombing anyway. The reality is when Richard Nixon came in, he had 550,000 American soldiers in Vietnam. By November of 1972, there were less than 30,000 U.S. troops there and not, and, and, um, um, and not really combat troops. So that was an overwhelming fact. They had, you know, that they couldn't keep fighting. I mean, that, that was the reality. They really couldn't, U.S. could not keep fighting. Well, correct, and, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. They they switched to air bombing, I thought. So that there's a there's a downplayment of troops on the ground, but there is a lot of bombing still. Is that well? There's still there's a lot of bombing, but nobody. I think that it was recognized by Nixon and Kissinger that you couldn't just go. Well, I, actually, I take it back. Kissinger might have been happy to bomb, you know, endlessly. I mean, he's so. In, you know, if you want to know lessons, I mean. To me, what is incredible in the survival of, of Kissinger as this iconic figure is his utter indifference to the pain and suffering caused to anybody. It's like, it's actually mind-blowing. And just if I can give you a very quick example of that, the Christmas bombing in December of 1972, I just wrote something about that, right? And that bombing was just because Kissinger was mad and he and Nixon wanted to like do as much damage as possible, but, you know, before leaving. But you know what? The, the North Vietnamese had improved their anti-aircraft cap capability. And the Secretary of the Air Force and the Secretary of the Census do not do the Christmas, do not bomb now because we're going to lose planes and we're going to lose pilots. And every hundred planes that, that go over there, at least three of them are going to be shot down and Americans are going to be killed. And Kissinger didn't care. And that's in fact what happened. Americans were killed. So, I mean, the indifference, you know, to me, it was actually really, you know, it was really shocking. But they did not think that, Bob Nixon didn't think that, other than being mean and making, you know, just expressing your rage, which he sometimes did, he didn't think that that was a viable way to continue the war. And after all, that's what Lance on 719 has shown. You, you know, so you're just going to keep bombing forever. You know, and and so I, I think that the peace movement had an enormous impact on this. I mean, if if there had not been a peace movement, would they have taken troops out or would they have added them? The military wanted to add, not subtract. Um, so, I, you know, I, I felt after, the, I mean, that's just the beginning of how I think the peace movement was important. Um, one other quick thing about the peace movement, you know, everybody sort of seems to say, you know, all oh, the McGovern campaign was like a flop. Look how badly he did, lost every state, et cetera. But what is not recognized is that McGovern had essentially consolidated the Democratic Party in an anti-war stance. And that that was very important in terms of what really happened. We usually forget this, but when Nixon won that landslide, two more anti-war senators were elected to the, to the Senate. 
And three of Nixon's allies in the, in the House, General Ford, uh, Senator Stennis, Senator Goldwater, one week after Election Day, they go up to the White House and they say to Nixon, there will be no more money for this war after January 1st. You have got to settle it now. And as far as Nixon is concerned, that's the last word. He is determined to have it be settled. So one of the lessons which, uh, you know, we didn't really talk about till the end that I learned really was that, you know, that the peace movement really made a huge difference, that having an aroused citizenry made a difference. Um, that's not to minimize the tragedy that happened in that place, right? I mean, you know, obviously we would have liked to have stopped it, you no, know, of course not. before, of course but, not, yeah. but I, I kind of came away from my research feeling like, wow, we actually made more of a difference than we actually uh, appreciated. So I, in terms of what we're, you know, thinking about now, I, I, know, I don't think that was exactly what you're really asking me about, but um, I think that, you know, now more than ever, we need a citizenry that's mobilized. And American policy is a mess, you know, and people are being massacred in, in, in Gaza right now by, you know, U.S. officials who think this is the only way to go. So, but, the, but we're seeing right now that there's a lot of protests coming on, right? Of course, this country, New York City, is filled with protests. Um, and maybe that's going to make a difference. So that's one of my takeaways. That's a good place to end. Very hopeful. We we agree. American citizens need to get more involved. Carolyn Eisenberg, thank you so much. Everyone, please check out her book, Fire and Rain, Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia. And we'll see you all soon. Bye. And thank you for having me.